Welcome to DJ Intro to DJing and uh, and running an internet radio and you know tips and tricks for running an internet radio shows. I am your host DJ Sean Bass. A um, little bit about me. I have been a I've been DJing. I'm gonna date myself here. I'm old as fuck. So I started DJing back in 1998. Back in the rave circuit. Some of you, some people are like, dude, I was created in 1998. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> That's what I say. I'll punch you in the throat. You say, you tell me you were created in 1998, I will punch you in the throat. So don't just don't be like, oh wow, you were born in the 1900s. I'm like, oh, you will die. Fuck you. So. I love you guys, but I'm just just a warning right now. That's that's triggering for me. So I've been playing years, years. I start off before that. I was a professional dancer. I back in the early '90s. I toured with a number of different singers. I've been in music videos. Um, I've plays have been in industry for a very very long time. A lot of my mentors, the people who influenced me in the way that I spin are actually now it's so funny because I knew them when they were nobodies and played with them and DJ with them and if I run into them today they're like dude how have you been blah, blah, blah. people are like how did you know this person like I don't know if you heard of a DJ you guys maybe you heard of a DJ named uh, Doc Martin I've known Doc Martin for over 20 years he's a really good friend of mine Maybe you guys heard of a DJ named uh, DJ Dan. DJ Dan is another really, really good friend of mine. Um, there's a Grammy award-winning producer. He's produced stuff for Jill Scott. He does stuff for TV and movies um, by the name of JJ. JJ, was on, he owns a record label called Shifted Music. He's also a really, really good friend of mine. We go back so many years. I'm actually a signed artist on his label. Him and I produce music together. I mean... Um, you guys have heard of Andy Caldwell? Andy Caldwell? Yeah, I knew Andy Caldwell when he first started out. I also knew Cascade when he first started out. Cascade used to DJ for me. Cascade was playing for me. I would pay him $200 to play at Mission Rock in San Francisco. That's how far back I go. I mean, all, a lot of these huge, huge big name DJs were actually just it's so funny because I will run into him. My wife's been with me, and it'll be a huge, like, huge name, and we'll run into each other, and they'll see each other, like, oh, my, oh, they're like, and they see me, and they instantly recognize me. We hug it out, and my wife's like, how did you know this person? I'm like, oh, that's so-and-so. She's like, wait a minute, do you know who that is? I'm like, yeah, I knew them when they were, like, nobody. We were starting, we were hanging out together. We were flying car. We were flying cars together back in like the early '90s. She's like, "What?" I'm like, "Yes." So, I'm old as fuck, and I've been around a long time, and I know a lot of people. So I'm gonna run down this, and I'm gonna teach you guys the do's and don'ts, some intros if you want to learn about DJing, software, what to do, running an internet radio show, things to look out for, and how to be successful at it. So moving on to my next slide. So I don't have a lot of slides. But on each slide, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to engage. I'm also going to, you know, ask you. You know, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please come up to the mic and ask me. And I will on. I will. I'm not going to pull any punches. I will. I will I answer you honestly from the heart, from my own experience, and all the things I've been through and everything I've seen. Because I want this next generation of DJs to flourish, but I want them to also flourish in the proper way. The biggest, I'm gonna tell you right now, the biggest, I would say, like, thing that was like raking nails across the chalkboard for me was during the EDM era and these DJs slamming tracks into each other, not beat matching, not even matching tracks on key, just going track to track and mixing by a drop and with zero talent. And then you, and then that, and then you had the celebrity DJs who didn't even DJ. They were coming in with pre-recorded sets and pantomiming. That is that 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 to me was the thing that drove me nuts. So I'm going to talk about those things, and I'm going to make sure we, you guys know, 
what the do's and don'ts are and how to move forward. Okay. Oh, it just jumped to the last slide. Hold on. Okay, so a little bit about me. Again, I've been DJing for a very, 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 very long time. I have a, right now I have a current radio show on My House Radio FM. Um, it's the largest global radio, uh, house music radio sh station uh, in the world. Um, we have over 100 affiliates in which we cross broadcast on. Uh, my show runs every Tuesday. It's the Dirty Bass, uh, Dirty Bass Sessions. Um, and yeah, I've numerous guests, you know, uh, I do tribute mixes to a lot of different DJs and stuff I know and producers, but I've been doing this for, like I said, I've been doing this for a while. So let's move right on from there. So, a lot of questions, people, this is one of the most common questions I get asked. People ask me about DJ software. What's the best DJ software? What should you use? Well, what that boils down to is, what are you trying to do? Where are you, tr what are you playing on? What equipment do you have? And what is your end goal? If your end goal is to play in nightclubs, then you need to learn record box. A record box can be a little clunky. It can be a little iffy. Sometimes it just pisses you off. You just wanna take it and throw it against the wall and jump on it. But record box, is Pioneer Software. And in 99.999% of every club across the world, you will find the industry standard is Pioneer equipment. They're gonna have CDJ 2000s or NX2s or CDJ 3000s. The mixer is gonna be a DJM 2000, DJM 900 NX2, or it's going to be a DJ A9. All of these are Pioneer equipment. Record box is embedded in the firmware of every single piece of Pioneer equipment. So if you plan on playing in a club, if whether you like it or not, you need to learn Record box. Record box has two modes. It has what they call Explorer mode, where Explorer mode, allow, which is the free mode, it allows you to go through all of your, your tracks, Take your tracks, put them in to create playlists from your tracks, set cue points, and then you can export those to a USB. When you export them, those playlists to a USB, you can go to any piece of Pioneer equipment, CJ2000, wherever, plug in, and that software, the hardware and the software all will automatically see your playlist, load and, br and upload all of your set cue points in every single track that you do. So. If you plan on playing in a club, you need to learn record box. There is no way around it. Now, if you plan on playing just, if you are just a home DJ, or you plan on maybe playing, uh, just like uh, being happy, one of the internet DJs that plays on Twitch, or plays with like in Final Fantasy, and one of these little, you know, Twitch offset game room type deals, then you can use, software such as um, Serato, or you can use software like um, the Tractor software, which is the tr you know, which I actually used to use. And it again, it all boils down to what you're playing on and where, you're, where your end goal is. Now, good news for all of my other users, such as my, my Tractor user, people who use, tra who use Rain hardware, who use like Denon, who use Newmark, who use uh, the Native Instruments hardware like the Tractor Control S4, S2. Rekordbox 6, the newest versions that have been coming out, now have an additional software update that you can download that will map your controller. So no longer do you have to download the software download the, the little extension, and then go through and hand map each button to what you want it to do on your controller. Now they have the mapping pre-done for you. Base, like literally you would download it, you run the extension, and it'll come through and say, okay, which 
one of these controllers do you have? You choose a controller, and it will pre-map all the buttons for you. So you're not restricted to just Pioneer equipment anymore, which is great because I'm not gonna lie, Pioneer, Pioneer controllers are expensive. They're the industry standard. They are, they are the GOAT. I mean, I still, I, I still DJ, when I do a lot of my mobile gigs off of a uh, Pioneer DDJ SG, S, uh, SJ, w I know, SZ, which was the flagship controller. It's one of the, only, it was the first controller that allowed you to use two laptops. But I got that controller in back in, what, honey, was it 2012, 2013? Yes, that controller's over 10 years old and it's still running, still works up off all the software. So if you do, if you are looking for that piece of equipment that for longevity, Pioneer, it, it, it costs more, a little bit more but if you're looking for longevity, I would highly recommend the Pioneer equipment because it's gonna be supported by more things and it ha it, the way the equipment, they don't make their equipment to be swapped out with the next newest, the next thing, like, uh, like an iPhone. No, they understand that their equipment expense is expensive. So they make sure that when you do make the investment, you are going to be able to utilize and benefit off of each and every revenue, uh, you know, re revolution of the software that they do. They'll release new, release new drivers, they'll release new firmware updates, everything. But they want to make sure that if you did invest in a pine in some pioneer equipment, that it's going to work. So that's my take on DJ software. We got a party going, okay, so, just like I, ta I talked about a little bit before, I touched on it before, equipment, so like I said, again, club standards, which you're gonna find in clubs are CJ2000s, CJ3, newer clubs are gonna have the CJ3000s, okay? Uh, these two, th uh, when I say CJ2000, some have the older models, some have the NX2, uh, CJ2000 NX2Ss. Those are all great. They work great. Again, they all have record box installed on their firmware. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about is when you use record box software to categorize, create playlists of all your tracks, set your cue points, you can X you can take a flash drive, you can plug that into your hard drive, you can plug that into your computer, and then you basically tell all of your playlists that you've done in the software, you can export those to the drive, and now, once they're exported to the drive, any CDJ you go into, any piece of Pioneer equipment you plug into it, that it'll pop it in the software as a device. You can load the device, you can either import the playlist to the local machine, or you can you operate the playlist directly off of your flash drive or whichever thing. And also, Pioneer, which I love them, because a lot of flash drives and a lot of different things, you know, people, I've had horror stories where, you know, you throw yourself on a playlist, it's on a flash drive, and then all of a sudden somebody pulls a flash drive out, your playlist got corrupted and stuff, and now you can't play anymore and you have to go redo your whole thing. Well, Pioneer, back in 2021, put out a different piece of hardware. It was their solid state SSD Pioneer drive. It is pre-formatted for record box. So you take this little itty bitty hard drive, which I'll show you right now how small it is. It's amazing. I hope it's in here. Left that, out, left that out at the drive. <laughs> oh, nope, it's so small it's actually in my pocket. I forgot. <laughs> Feel free to come on up, you guys. Take come, everyone, come up, take a look. I want everyone to understand. See what this is. This is. 
This I got for $89 on Amazon. This is the Pioneer Solid State SSD. It is a one terabyte drive. So, so you gotta understand, majority of CDJs, especially the NX2s, the maximum a CDJ, especially in the high, even all the way to the NX2s, can read is one is a one terabyte drive. So if you if you get a hard drive of two terabyte or something like that, and you try and format it with record, it's only gonna work on your computer. It's only gonna work on your computer. If you plug a two terabyte drive into a, a CDJ two thousand, it will not see it at all. So. Knowing the maximum that can be utilized by any, by what's the industry channel, which is the CJ2000 right now, is one terabyte. This is the fastest drive. Normally when you get a, a, an SSD or a hard drive or a USB, you, and you, you always want to look for the fastest seat time, late and lowest latency, but you want, you plug it in, you have to go through a whole process of reformatting the drive and then just to get record box to recognize it. And then you tell, and I've found drives and I've had record box go through and format the drive and get it ready for it so it can utilize it. This came pre programmed for record box. I plugged it in, I opened record box, record box, like, oh, cool, you got a drive. I'd have to do a damn thing but export my playlist to it. It's super fast seek time, it's super reliable, and you see how small it is. I roll up to gigs with this and a set of headphones, and that's it. I'm good. So I really want to stress that. When you plug it in, how long does it take for the CDJ to like read? Seconds. 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 Like normal SSD hard drives, you plug them in, it takes a minute. This, within three seconds, Rec the, the first the drive that you plug it into goes, oh, I see it. Then you push the link button, the other drive goes, oh, okay, cool, you got a record box drive. Uh, oh, we cool, it's Pioneer equipment. You're and it, it's up and working, you don't have to worry about a thing. I've dropped this, kicked this, stomped on it. It's fallen out of my bag. It's damn near been driven over by a car. <laughs> These things are worth the money. They are durable as hell and they work no matter what. How, how much I've audio can that hold? What's that? How much audio can that hold? It's a terabyte of audio. So if you're going through your, so if you're going through your, uh, your play, you, if you're using record box, you can go through your play, you can create your playlist and just, you just, in the th what you do is you, in that software, you would export your playlist. You would choose the playlist and say export and you would say export to and you show the drive. It shoots it all over, analyzes the tracks, it's all done. You walk into the club, you plug it into your, you plug in the CDJ, works instantly, everything loads. So, highly, highly recommend this. I fell, I found this by accident, by looking up on the Pioneer DJ forum back in 2021, coming out of COVID, going, is there any, what is the best USB or SSD to use with record box, this popped up. I'm like, Pioneer makes their own drive? Oh, okay, I'm gonna get that. And I looked up all the reviews. It had like 4.999 out of five stars across every single DJ form. So, highly recommend that. Moving right along. So, let's get down into techniques. DJing techniques. There's a lot of different styles to DJ. So a couple of them now, being an old school vinyl DJ, like myself, the mixer I learned on was an old school, school Yuri mixer. Now Yuri mixer didn't have the up and down slides. It had knobs. It was, the Yuri mixers were the old school like disco DJ mixers. Now. The extension to the extension portion to that, so you had no effects, no up and down, no crossfader. You just had knobs for each channel. Yuri added an extension portion to that, which gave you, with the extension portion, gave you the highs, mids, and lows, which were also 
on knobs. So that I learned when I the way I learned to mix was beat matching. There weren't beat counters on the mixer like they are now. There was no sync button like there is now. No, it was and you were on a turntable. So turntables, you have to constantly adjust the pitch up and down to keep it matched. It's not digital, it's not like it is digital. Turntables were anal are analog. So when the record is playing, sometimes it, it could be completely matched and then all of a sudden it could slow down a half a second. So you were constantly working that little, the pitch on that turntable, you know, tap it up or tap it down to keep it on beat. The techniques I learned was you had to mix every track. When you, when you mix two tracks together, they had to be able to play together for a minimum of 60 seconds before you faded one track out. And y using that philosophy, it was a very Naziistic, hardcore philosophy. I'm not gonna lie, it sucks balls. But because of having that foundation, I can hop onto any piece of equipment and I can DJ and I can beat match. I can beat match within seconds. I can pop a track on and have 10 seconds left in the tr and one in the track and instantly just by ear, hearing one track, hearing the one, hearing what's coming in in the monitor, hearing what's in my ear, in, the, in, in my thing, instantly match the beats, fade it over without missing a beat while having a drink and eating food. It's because of this, this way that I was taught. This is, it's a very old school archaic way. It's very hard. If you wanna challenge yourself while DJing, try it. Do, don't use, turn off your sync button. Turn off your, turn off everything else. Don't look at what the BPMs are. Take two different tracks, have one playing, mix the other track in using just your ear. One ear is hearing what the track is. You can use the Q fader to blend the kind of blend the sounds, or you can do it the old school way, which was on the mixes I learned, they didn't have that Q button. There was no Q button, so you had to hear what was the neck, what, what you were trying to mix in, in one ear, and you had to mix that off of the booth monitor which was what was playing. And you had to hear that. You had to count the beats in your head. You learned how to beat count. So you would hear a track start. Now, BPM counting, if anyone's like, what is beat counting? Well, the way beat counting works is you have two different kinds of music. You have house, you have house music slash dance music, and you have hip hop. Well, House music works on a 32 measure, meaning the track in the waveform, if you're watching it, it will go 32 beats before it adds or subtracts anything to the track. So it's a 32 beat, one, two, and, and when I say 32 measure, a measure is eight beats. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yes, now the ideal times, if you were mixing, AKA beat matching, you wanna bring anything in and it's on the one and the one. So if this, tr if you go 32 beats, you wanna bring the next track in as on the one and the one. They're gonna flow smoothly. As you get more advanced, you can bring something in on the one, the 16 and the one. And as you get better and better, you can bring stuff in like I can do now where I can come in on the 24 and the one and still make it match and blend the sounds. Now, a way to challenge yourself when, with this style of mixing is mixing on the one and the one and knowing this is where knowing your music comes in. You know when your buildup is. You know at that 32 beat the, where the kick drums are gonna add. You know at the next 32 beat where the bass line is gonna come in. You know at the next 32 beat where the vocals are gonna come in. So you, it's about knowing your music. And knowing your music, you can know, okay, this song is gonna come hit, hit here. When this comes out, I'm gonna drop the bass line out of this track, put the bass line in on the next track, 
and then I'm gonna blend the two vocals in because they're both on the same key, which is, you know, goes into key mixing by ear, mixing key mixing. So it's a lot of different things, but what it boils down to is one, knowing the mathematics of beat matching. If you learn that mathematics of properly beat matching, where you can play two tracks simultaneously for 60 seconds or longer, and you can, and they are completely matched. When I say completely matched, they are playing perfectly synced. You can take the, the lows out of one track and the boost the, lay, boost the, the lows on another track, tweak your mids, tweak your highs, and you can remix a song live while, it's, while the two songs are playing just by ear. This is how I learned. This is the old school. This is, this is the way that disco DJs in the 70s were playing. And this is how I was trained. It was horrible. I wanted to throw my records at walls. But you know what? This is how I learned. And it goes from there. Now, that is for dance music and house music. Hip hop is a whole new element. Hip hop changes on the 16 beat. So it goes 16 beats and then it changes. 16 measures and then it changes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then something else gets added to the track or taken out of the track. So hip hop, with it going on a 16 beat measure, allows you for the quick mix. That's when you can scratch, you can bring something in, bring in the vocals, drop this in, in and out, and you can move it in and it allows for a quick, fast transition. It's designed for quick, fast transitions. Unlike dance music, which is designed, designed and dance, disco, anything like that, which is designed to be beat for beat, and then you slowly transition it out, hip hop is designed for the quick transition. Now, there's another style of music out there which breaks the norm of all the dance music trends. It's called two-step or UK garage. UK Garage is literally sped up hip hop. Hip hop could be anywhere from 68 beats per, beats, beats per minute up to maybe, I've seen it to 128. UK Garage or Two Step starts at 130 and can go up to like 150, 160. It's super fast and you'll recognize the beats because you'll hear like, scat, 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 scat. What came from UK Garage was break beats. That's where breaks came from. Okay? What came from UK Garage was dubstep. So you or, or you, there's lots of there's and there's two categories to UK Garage. You have both you have what the what they call the light side, which is all the vocals and the fun the, the poppy stuff. And then you have the dark side, which is a hard, chunkier, funkier, just in your face like type stuff that you'll find that goes into breaks, goes into dubstep, and, and goes from there. So the second now, the other thing I want to talk about is when using software, people mix, you can mix by ear, or you can mix visually because in DJ software, you see the waveforms moving, either going across this way or going up and down. From my experience, I will advise highly against mixing by waveforms. Do not trust the computer because the computer will screw you over. If it cannot detect certain things within certain kinds of music, if you're going to just cause kind of house music or dance music or EDM, it's Generally, it's okay. But if you start going into ecl different eclectic styles of music and you try and mix by waveform, you are going to train wreck 100%. And if those of you who don't understand what train wrecking is, train wrecking is a DJ term for when you have one, one track that's coming in and the next track that you bring in is off beat and the beat sounds like and then you hear the and then it sounds all like trash. And then usually the DJ recovers by backspinning one record and then bring in and then you kind of hear the track and the, the crowd just thinks they're doing something cool. Other DJs and music producers are like, yeah, bitch, I heard you train wreck. We're looking at each other, judging each other like, yeah, I, I heard that. I saw that. Y you know, you're not getting away with that. The rest, the, the normies didn't even fuck that. We caught that. 
So I would highly recommend against using dissing by waveform. Now, a lot of DJ equipment has a sync button. Do not trust the sync button. The sync button will fail you. Sync buttons are linked to pieces within the DJ software, which is a function called a quantize. Well, the quantize, it can quantize to the fourth beat, the eighth beat, the 16th, the 32nd. And unless you are hopping in and literally mapping and lining up these ones, specifically song by song so that you know, never mix by the sync button because your sync button works for hip hop DJs. Sync button works because they can sync up two hip hop tracks and go in and they can scratch. They can sync up two hip hop tracks and jump on the third deck and start scratching and then mixing in acapellics on a fourth deck. So they can, it, they look really, really fancy by mixing four decks at one time. But the two major decks are using the sync button. So you can do that with the beats are matched and you have them dined up. But for club wise, don't ever mix by the sync button. It's actually, honestly, it's actually frowned down upon. If you come into the club, it's uh, yeah, if you use a sync button and you're just using it to do effects by you know dropping in a few things like that, and then you go back and you turn it off and you go back, people look down upon you. But yes, if you are mixing every, tr if you're using the sync button to beat match and match every track, every mix. Other DJs are gonna notice seasoned club goers who look over and take snapshots or video you DJing if you're dropping the cuts. If your sync button is on, they all know what the sync button is. The last thing you wanna get caught with is your sync button being illuminated while you are mixing tracks and fist pumping. Because guess what, that hits social media, that hits the internet and you are literally looped into the category of a celebrity DJ who can't mix and has one track going the entire time while they're fist pumping and they're pantomiming. That's how it's looked upon. It can be frowned upon. If you are scratching, doing fader effects and doing all the kind of stuff and using the sync, bu sync button that way and the loop buttons along with the effect buttons on the, on the equipment, you're fine. But when you start going into using that sync button just to beat match and mix tracks, you will get called out and you will get clowned and that's the last thing you want because as soon as club promoters find out the only way you can mix is via the sync button, you will not get booked at that party anymore because no promoter wants that on their, they're booking DJs. They don't want the sync button DJ on their thing because people will be like, oh dude, you booked that sync button DJ? Fuck, why am I gonna come to your party? Your party sucks, you can't even get DJ that can mix. And that's what it comes down to. Okay, so now, going off of that, I'm gonna talk about radio shows. So, by show of hands, it, how many of you are interested in you know hopping in and possibly doing you know internet radio show? Okay, there's a couple of things. You know, there's different styles of radio shows, and there's you know I've you know been to the Ringer and figured out the ins and outs of each different thing and what the pros and cons are. So first one, let's talk about let's talk about Twitch. Twitch is great. Twitch is amazing. Twitch is a great platform. However, with Twitch, you do Twitch is not its own standalone. You do have to use another software such as like OBS or something else that's coming in. Now doing that, unless we're well, using like OBS, you want to set up your pre pre slides or pre whatever that's going on, or you want to have someone else running it for you and setting up your multi -ca multiple camera angles and doing the switch panel for you to make you look good. Because Twitch is very, it's bland. Here you are, here it is. You have to use the external broadcasting video editing software to make yourself look good. Because if you have a crappy, if you're, if you're putting yourself out there on Twitch and you're broadcasting your show 
and you don't have all the bells and whistles and the cool fade-ins, fade-outs, and stuff like that, you're going to get talked about. People are going to talk bad to you, and people are going to come back, come back to your channel. So either, but the saving grace on that is if you may not have those things, you may only have maybe one or two angles, but if you are an amazing fucking DJ, and y people, and you have one one camera angle is on you, and the second camera angle is above your deck, and people can see you on the decks working your magic, guess what? You're gonna get followers, because people are gonna be like, oh, you know what? This guy doesn't need all the bells and whistles that everyone else has to make themselves look good. This guy's got skills, watch. I guarantee you, when this guy is done, he's dropping that mixer because it's, it's smoking. Because they can see you work in the tracks and you're doing things. So when you're, when you're on there and you're, and you're going off, yeah, you push the button and your clicker or whatever in OBS to switch to that one angle. So they're watching you on the deck sport your magic. You're gonna get the viewers that way. Another thing that, uh, and you know, with the Twitch, a lot of people tie into like, you know, going to the gaming servers. You know, I've been offered, you know, doing stuff on like Final Fantasy. I still have yet to connect with my friends. They wanted me to come in and you know, they had built out an avatar for me and everything in the whole nine where, you know, I could connect to my, tw and I'm still, you know, this is something I'm still new to, is connecting my DJing into the gaming community. Which is a which I have recently discovered is a huge, huge thing. There are numerous games where people go into, especially these MMO where people are creating their own worlds and stuff. And you go into and they'll be getting invited because they're group into a specific area. You go into and you walk into this one specific clan area, and it's a nightclub, and they've got a, someone DJing and it's an avatar there, and the and you're stream you're basically streaming via Twitch live into the video game, and you know people could click on. There's like a thing they can go up and they can click on like the link next to the DJ, and then it would take them and open up a separate window where they could actually see you DJing live on next to your avatar. So there, this is something st I'm still g learning, but I'm discovering it's a huge new community. It's and it's it's a learning thing for me too as well. YouTube, you need to understand a couple things. YouTube will is your great but YouTube will bite you in the ass. YouTube works along a long time, a lot of these FCC guidelines and copyright things, and you could put on a great stream through YouTube and play one track that is a flagged track, and all of a sudden YouTube mutes your stream. And you are just jamming, you don't even know what's going on until you see the chat going, dude, I can't hear your stream anymore. It's because you played a section of a track that's in the AI algorithm that it thinks, oh, okay, this is a f copyrighted flag track, and it flags it, and then it flags your stream. So I stand behind doing pre-recorded streams uploading them and then putting them up to broadcast because at least through that way you have an element of control. If you're in one of the gaming servers, you can kind of do your own thing. You're not going to get flagged. But if you're uploading sets or you're trying to stream live off of YouTube, just know you are one track away from getting flagged and muted. And that is the worst thing that can ever happen to you, especially if you, if you are killing on the decks and the AI algorithm, which the AI al algorithm has flagged tracks that I actually produced, that I own the rights to, has flagged them and said, this music is copyrighted, you have to contact Sony and music, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I had to dispute it and go, I produced it, I own this track, and do a back and forth thing for about a week and a half before I get an apology email and suddenly my stream is freed. Well, 2.5 weeks later, that kind of doesn't help me. So I want to warn people against you know doing stuff on YouTube because it's great, but it can totally come back to bite you in the ass. Now I want to talk about things that I have discovered that popped up during COVID and all these other things, because I was propositioned by multiple radio stations out there to play for them. 
there are a lot of online scam DJ radio shows out there that will scam you out of your money and they offer what they call a pay to play scenario. The radio station I'm on right now, my house radio, I don't pay. I was sequestered by them. I came on, I played my show. You know, once a year, I donate to the station just to keep everything up and going. But there are, I would say, maybe 90% of the radio stations out there are pay to play stations, which is they will look, they'll catch your Twitch stream. They're going to ping you, hey, come on here. We want you on our station. We want you on our station. Have you play? You're like, oh, this is great. This is great. And they, then they'll hit you up with a, yeah, you know what? It's uh, it's ten dollars a month to play here. You know our station, you know, and or it's twenty dollars a month, and da da. And we're gonna guarantee you this amount of users and viewers, and which they do not. These are scams. Real reputable stations, radio stations, will not charge you to play. Again, reputable internet DJ radio stations will not charge you to play. They are not pay-to-play stations. They are user-driven. So they judge you by the traffic that you bring in. So if you are bringing in the users during your th and the people logging on and you are having showing that you have a consistent user base, you're not going to get charged. If you don't have that user base, they're going to nix you. But if you can bring in those users, they will not charge you. And these are the stations you want to go for because those are the ones that you have to self-market, you have to self-promote, you have to drive the traffic. You've got to grind. I'm not going to lie. you got to grind. you got to get out there. you got to find someone like, you know, luckily for me, I'm, my wife is a social media guru, but you need to find the per. You need to find, get your social media friends, have them help you drive the traffic. Because if those stations that are not, pay to play that are uh, traffic driven they have multiple affiliates and that like i said that's how i am on my house radio my house radio has over a hundred affiliates roku apple tv radio you name it they are all over global my radio my radio show is every tuesday from 9 a.m to 11 a.m pacific standard with a replay on uh, replay at uh, 6 p.m. Actually, either it used to be 5 p.m. Switched it now. It's like it's either 5 or 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It airs since it's a global station. It airs. My show airs 9 to 11 a.m. here. That's 12 to 2 p.m. East Coast time. That's 5 to 7 p.m. in the UK. I have a huge following internationally in the UK, Morocco, Germany, France, Scotland, because when, of, of when my show airs, we go when it goes live, make sure you find a station that uh, not only al allows you to upload, but allows you to that has a chat function so you can interact with your with your patrons with your users talk to them find out what they like what they don't like you know they'll give you kudos people like that interaction if you're interacting with people while your while your set is going on they're going to come back the very next week with 10 more people and more people after that and it's going to grow and you're going to end up having a following right now at any given time i have anywhere from 30 to 70 people logged on just on the website, not going across the affiliates. If I look at the, my numbers across the affiliates, I have anywhere from, you know, from 70 to like 250, 300 people logged on during my sets at any given time. And which is why my radio show, you know, has been going on since 2017, 2018. But yeah, again, so I want to stress Make sure you do your research. If you're gonna do an internet radio show, research the station. 
Go to Facebook, go to Reddit, look it up, look up the station, look up the person who's running the station. Google them, look them up, see, look up the station, is, it, is this a pay to play? Are they guaranteeing the users? Because some stations will do the fake users. They're like, oh yeah, just to get your money. They'll show you numbers that you're pulling in users, but they're bots. And, they're, they, and they don't have any mass push out. So they're literally scamming new DJs. So now I want to open this up to some Q&A. If you have any questions about DJing, running internet radio show, anything, please come up to the mic. I will be happy to answer, give you tips, pointers, software, equipment. You know, I be, like I said, this year, I'm going to be 50 in October. That's right, I'll be 50 in October. I don't look it, thank God, but I am happy to bestow my years of knowledge and everything I've been through to the next generation so that they can come up because I want to see this is a craft. The last thing I want to do is see my craft taken over by AI because AI cannot do what we do. AI cannot fill out a crowd. AI cannot be at the pool party and see people jamming and go, you know what? The beats are on point, but this crowd is not feeling it. Who's in the crowd? Okay, looks like I got some Gen Xers, got some millennials, up oh, a few Gen Zers. What track can I play next? That's gonna get every single person going. AI can never do that. We as people do that. So I want to pass on my knowledge because I want to see the next generation do what I'm doing. So if you have any questions, please come up to the mic. What's up, man? Thank, first of all, thanks for the the panel. No problem. Both of you. Team, dream team, <laughs> dream team. <laughs> and thanks for support, killing support, that. Supportive wife right there. Yep, yep. Thanks for the pool party earlier too. You already know. It's yeah, by the way, I'm probably gonna be heading back to the pool party. If it's still, if it's still jumping, people still out the pool because it's hot as hell, I'm gonna be jumping on for another set, so. Hell yeah. Um, so I was wondering um, two things. So uh, me and my partner that we were, we were talking to earlier, we you know, have been mostly DJing on Twitch for a little while um, and we're starting to you know, get out, network, we're talking to people at different clubs in the city and everything, and um, we've mostly been using, uh, we've only been using a controller, so we have like a Danone, you know, yeah. uh, and so we've been talking to everyone like, yeah, you gotta learn CDJs, so we're like, cool. Yes. And um, so one thing that we were wondering, we've been like talking to people we can't figure out is, is it a club standard to be using like, you know, 320 kilobytes MP3s or like all AIFF or waves okay. and stuff? Okay, MP3s. Yeah. MP3 is the standard format. All the DJ equipment uses MP3s. So I would say set your stuff up at the minimum is 192 kilobytes. Minimum is 192, okay? If you have any random tracks that you've downloaded them, before you export them and put them in, into a playlist that you're gonna play on CDJ, run them through a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, with a normalized filter. I do several. I do, I produce a lot of my tracks on, um, on, Lo on Logic, Logic, at Logic Pro X. I've also done stuff on Ableton Live as well as uh, the PreSonus X software. So take your tracks, whatever you're getting, whether it's a wave file or anything like that, take it, open it up in a DAW, it'll come up in one channel. Create a second channel, which will be a stereo out, and open it up and create a bus, what they call a bus, where you're feeding it to that, Put a fil and then open it up and put a normalized filter on it. Then, bounce that project or whatever that track is and save it as an MP3. During that process, it is going to normalize. The normalized process is it takes out pops and clicks and drastic jumps in the volume of the track. Because sometimes you'll, you'll download a track and it sounds great, but it's unbalanced. And you go to play it, you play it in your headphones, it sounds great. You play it on the decks, it sounds like shit. So running, taking that track, opening it up in a DAW, and using the DAW to export it to an MP3 with a normalized filter is going to 
give you a studio quality track. Unless you're getting tracks from a DJ pool. Yeah, like or no, unless you're getting tracks from a DJ pool, DJ pool tracks are already set oh. at the highest quality, you know, kilobytes per second. They're they're already they're already mastered. You pulling shit off a of SoundCloud or someone sending you a track that they made, yes, you need to go through the process in the DAW and clean it up. What is a DAW? Digital Audio Workstation. So DAW is the terminalized for producers or anything. People will say DAW. You're going to hear DAW. You hear that a lot. That is a digital audio workstation. That could be Pro Tools, Logic, um, Ableton Live, PreSonus. There's so many different, you know, uh, different digital audio workstation software out there, SoundForge, just across the spectrum. But it's about how you use it and how you use it to export your tracks. People, you, you can use digital, people use their DAWs for recording live instruments. People, as a DJ, I, use, I record directly off of, I, I send my feed out of my controller into my second computer with my DAW running ProLogic and I record my channels in there. That way I can listen to them back. I c and when that way when, I'm exp when I bounce the selection to, you know, to create the MP3 file that I upload for my show, it automatically has a normalized filter in it. So it's gonna normalize. It's gonna pull the highs and lows. It's gonna make sure there's no high peaks, no low peaks. It's gonna make it sound good. So very, very, very important is knowing those things. Whether you're producing music, but especially if you're DJing and recording your sets, you need to make sure you, you rec if all, all possible, send your track. Don't do it on two computers. If you're using a controller, you send that out feed directly to, to, your, to, to your second computer. And that second computer, whether it's coming in through like, whether it's an inbox or whatever it's coming in, it's co you're coming out of XLR feeds, it's coming in, it goes in through a US, it, that is taking that analog audio signal, it's being converted to a, U, to a digital signal via USB, and that USB sound driver is being picked up into the digital, uh, into the DAW, and now it's coming in. It's, it's basically converting the analog audio signal that's coming out of your mixer or your controller into a digital signal. And once you have that digital signal, then that's where you can do all your edits. Go ahead, I got time for one more question. Anyone else, questions? Yeah, um, so you talked about like running a radio show and just put DJing out by the pool here yeah. and gauging the energy, which you're right, AI can never manage to. Um, I was just wondering, how do you gauge the energy on a radio show, on an internet show? Like on Twitch, at least you have the chat, but if you're just out there, just broadcasting into the world. Know your audience. Okay. Know your audience. What my radio show, what I've done is, I started off, and it was a little bit hard at first. I started off first by uploading a couple of shows, and then every once in a while, I would stream live, and then I would watch the chat, and I would see what people were into, and the audience that was logging in during my time spot. Also, looking at the DJ in my, uh, on the station, who's before me and who's after me, what are their styles? Okay, I wanna make sure that my style stands out, but it's not contradictory to what the person before me is playing and then what the person after me is playing. If I can create that go-between, it ensures that now I'm gonna, get the, I'm gonna get the feed over from the DJ who was coming in before me, and I'm gonna blend into the people that are tuning in for the DJ who's people who are loyal fans of the DJ who's playing after me because I'm playing a set that's complementary in between the two DJs. So it's a lot about, it's, this is where music formatting comes in and where you talk to your station and stuff and say, hey, this is what I wanna play, this is my style, what time slots do you have, who plays similar, I wanna play either before or after, in between these kind of styles. Like, 
I'm not going to, like, if I have a, a soulful, the guy who's for me is playing soulful, I'm not going to come in with a banging, hard, you know, happy, hardcore tech house set because I'm going to lose everyone. Okay? And then the guy behind me is playing, like, vocal house. I'm going to lose everyone. That's what's going to happen. So know your audience. Know, do your research. Know who's playing before you, who's playing after you and talk to the station about proper programming, and that's how you ensure a successful show, is making sure that your programming, so you don't sound like a carbon copy of the person before and the person after you, you have your set as complementary to what the person before you plays, the person after you plays, but you add your own twist into the middle of it to make yourself stand out. All right, any more questions? Okay, so last slide here. Okay, my last slide is scan the QR code. If you want to get in touch with me after this, scan the QR code. I will be happy to answer any questions. You can get in touch with me. Anything you want to know, you know, I'm here to help. I was lucky enough to have very big name DJs who looked out for me, such as one of the biggest names in the, in the LGBT community, house, commu house community, uh, which is David Harness. He is one of my mentors, you know, really good friend of mine, known him for, f for years. I mean, w another tr a trans, uh, it was transgender at the time. They weren't even transgender, they were, just, uh, they, they were more of a drag queen DJ, produce, music producer, uh, Honey Dijon. Honey Dijon, is completely transgender, uh, you know, th she had the switch, she's completely a female now. She was one of the people who was up for the Grammys for Beyonce's album. She produced three of Deon Beyonce's tracks. And I didn't realize this, and I knew Honey Dijon, when Honey Dijon used to play for parties for me in San Francisco at, at uh, Snowdrift. And I used to just watch, watch her play on the decks, and we used to have a funny saying, we're like, man, when Honey Dijon gets off the decks, you just take the mixer, drop it on the ground, and kick it, because it's smoking. Because watching that, that woman play on the turntables was a sight to see. I had never seen anyone do the things that she did, and I learned so much from watching her and stuff that I still do to this day that I will break out and I'll do in the middle of a set. People are like, bro, that, was, that shit was tight. Where'd you learn that? I'm like, let me tell you. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thank you everyone for coming out. Thanks you know, I'm DJ Sean Bass, My House Radio. Uh, I hope I answered a lot of questions, gave you guys some pointers. And again, scan the QR code. If you have any questions, I'm here to help. I would love to pass on my knowledge because again, I feel my job is to groom and to help the next generation of DJs because I don't want them to be software driven or this, just the things that I see now that make me want to like turn over a DJ, you know, kick over somebody's turntables like, what the fuck are you doing? No, I want to see real DJs. I want to teach people how to DJ, I want to teach people how to produce music and I want to push the art forward and grow it. Thank you so much.